our producers, Shop Talk, where we are refining and redefining the sales game by equipping you with the tools you need to differentiate yourself in the marketplace. Tactical skills that will help you provide deliverable value to your clients and prospects. Here, these are conversations that will differentiate you from your competition. Now, if you don't want to be different than your competition, probably should just go ahead and shut this off. And action items that you can provide to take your prospects and clients to the next level. Like when we audit the mod and get and do the mod master and, and give them the actionable items that they can that they can do in order to lower their cost of risk. This is Power Producers Shop Talk. Production redefined. Reasonable and what wasn't. And and I think that you know that's that's spot on. And you know, these people that we're talking with don't necessarily understand what their exposures are and what they can even do about them um, you know, when they're uncovered. So I, I do like that what we're able to provide is something tangible, action items that they can do. Are you ready to feel the power? Hey everybody, welcome to Power Producers Shop Talk, episode 11. Yeah. Here with Kyle today. What's up? We're going to talk about claims. Big old nasty claims. You got more experience in this than I do. What I mean, I, I've got a couple, but um, they're they're relatively benign. Let's hear, let's hear your worst, man. Probably the worst one. I've got three really good ones that I've set aside for when we could talk about claims. And I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about claims that have sort of impacted me personally and in my career, not just because they were claims that happened, but how it shifted my thought process and made me look at things a little bit differently. I would say the first one is the one I had. I was down in Key West for Father's Day weekend four years ago. And I was out fishing offshore, uh, as I typically do. As you usually do, yeah. Went in Key West. And, um, you know, we got to – I've been known to catch a trophy fish or two, so we got to keep the cell phone camera handy. And uh, we had it there. And as we were getting back into the marina to dock the boat, my phone literally sounded like I was in the Seminole Hard Rock right smack in the middle of the slot machines. It was insane. <laughs> and it was just going off nonstop with alerts. And I'm like, okay, this can't be good. Nobody's alerting me that much or my phone is stuck in a loop. And I looked down at my phone and the last, because you know how it is, it's always the last text that shows up of a series, not the first one. Right. And it said, never mind, take your time. He died when he got to the hospital. <laughs> Jeez. And I'm like, you, you've got to be kidding me! Like, is this a, is this a real thing? Like, this this is actually not the text you want to see. No, and I'm like freaking out. So I like start backpedaling to figure out what's going on. And <laughs> basically, what happened? I mean, it was an accident, man. It was it was a legitimate accident. We had a driver that worked with one of my clients uh, that was driving one way. He needed to be going the other way, and so he dipped into the mouth of a street. He didn't do a full-blown U-turn. He, he kind of cut across and into the mouth of a street so then he could ease back out instead of trying to do a hard U. And when he did, he was driving one of those Ford Transits. It had a blind spot in it, and he pulled out and never saw the guy that T-boned him who was riding a motorcycle. So this is one of those claim scenarios that's like the scenarios you get when a CIC instructor gets up and gives you claim scenarios because it's got a lot of layers to it. But basically this guy that um, he, he pulled out complete accident, he, get, he gets T-boned by a guy on a motorcycle who was also riding with his two sons that were adults that were on motorcycles behind him. And they were out for their annual and traditional Father's Day motorcycle ride. Horrendous. We find out that the deceased gentleman was a surgeon. And both of the sons were also doctors. Um, Both of the sons were able to pull their dad over to the side of the road. And they were able to um, get him revived and that was sort of the thread was they got him revived and then it said, oh, never mind. He went, uh, he died when he got to the hospital. 
And the thing that's an issue with this and, and what really, you know, always has me thinking, number one, it's the first time in my career that I've ever had a death claim where somebody was killed as a result either of one of my client's actions or one of my employees' client, my client's employees were killed. Mm-hmm. I had never had to deal with that before. Um, but what really bugged me about it was this was a company that needed an umbrella. It was a right. company that I had proposed an umbrella to. I had told them they needed at least five, probably a $10 million umbrella, gave them the pricing, and the owner made the decision. He didn't want to spend the money on the umbrella, and so they never bought it. And here we are with the death claim and no umbrella. Right. And it bothered me because the company had 50 to 60 vehicles on the road. They were doing seven or eight million a year in sales. They definitely had the exposure. They definitely were a target. Not in this situation, obviously, but somebody could be. I mean, they've got, like you said, they've got vehicles that got, you know, wraps, they got their name all over it. Yeah, they're they're basically a a, a walking advertisement for slam your brakes on and let us rear end you, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's probably one of the only times too where I shouldn't say only times I get frustrated a lot, but it's probably one of the times where I've been the most frustrated in my career as well, because I gave somebody rock solid advice and they just simply ignored it. They, they were willing to sign off on the umbrella rejection form and not do anything about it. And that just drove me wild. So I picked up the phone and I called um, to let the underwriter know because I wasn't sure how quickly the underwriter and the claims person would talk. And the underwriter had no clue. And uh, he said, man, you better let the umbrella carrier know. And I said, we didn't we didn't have one. And he said, Whew, this is going to get nasty then. He said, because I can tell you right now, beyond a shadow of a doubt, we're going to go in and we're going to stroke a check for the million dollar combined single limit. And we're out. Right. Like we, we don't have any res- responsibility after that. So I mean, why stroke- would they do anything else? Yeah. Well, they wouldn't. And right. he said, we're stroking the check and leaving. So I talked to the CFO and it wasn't the CFO that made the decision. The CFO was behind getting the umbrella. It was the guy that owned the company that wasn't. And so I told him, I said, look, man, if nothing has made you come to Jesus, this should, you definitely need an umbrella Let me see if I can go back to the carrier and make an argument that this was the one shock loss they would have to worry about paying out. All the other losses and everything look good. We really need to get you on an umbrella sooner than later. Let me, let me see what, what, what I can do. And I went in and I made the argument and I won. I think my argument was awesome as far as I can tell, because I got the result that I wanted, but I basically got the underwriter to come back and give me the exact same pricing that they had originally given at renewal, even though there was a claim that was over a million dollars by the time you figure out the expenses and everything involved, there was an over a million dollar claim that was on the loss runs at that point that was disclosed to them. And so I went in and I pitched the umbrella to the owner and the CFO and the guy said, nah, I'm not going to spend the money on the umbrella. Now, mind you, this clown That's just ridiculous. had somebody kill uh, an innocent motorist, and he has the ability to go and, and pick up the umbrella now at the exact same cost and chooses not to do it. Guess what? They're out of business. Shocking. I, I wonder why. Right. It certainly couldn't have anything to do with the amazing business acumen of the non umbrella buyer. It's crazy. I mean, especially it, it, it's crazy to not do it after being advised to do it, but it's even crazier to not do it after you have a situation that specifically it would have helped in. <laughs> and then, and more than likely would have paid because that's what the underwriter told me was if you had a $5 million umbrella on this, this guy's a surgeon. No doubt. We're going to cap out the max out the 5 million umbrella too. Yeah. Right. That's, that's wild, man. So w- was that the one that you said kind of has adjusted the way you think and approach or is that a different one? It's No, it's one of them. Okay. I mean, all three, all three of these have to a certain degree. Sure. The other one really speaks more to 
the risk management approach that we take and why it's important to have leadership buy-in and and culture shift to a risk management focused culture um, in, in any company. And and I'll never forget this one. And I'm sure you've heard this one before too, but um, I don't know that you've heard the next one though. So I might, I might have uh, on the edge of my seat. Yeah. I might have a good one for you here. But this is a company that manufactures – it was a plastics company that did thermoforming and extruding of plastics. Mm -hmm. And um, they were in a building that they should not have been in, meaning they had massive equipment. This was – but they were in an old building. It was too cramped. And the frequency and severity both of the losses on the workers' comp and the subsequent results of the mod – showed that that was the case, but they were in the pro when we engaged, they were in the process of moving to a new facility, which was much more uh, along the lines of what they should have been in plenty of space to operate in, you know, state of the art, everything, blah, blah, blah. But one of the shortly before we engaged with them, they had an issue where one of the guys was changing out one of the rolls of, of, of the plastic film that they had mm-hmm. um, and putting it on the uh, – I'm sorry. No, they wasn't doing that. It was something different. What happens is these guys would chop this they – would, they would thermoform the pl- these long plastic sheets that were on a huge roll. So it would come out on the roll into the uh, thermoform – the thermoformer. It would do the the – cutting and stamping or whatever the the correct term is. And then there would be a plastic byproduct that then would be taken and dumped into this heater that would melt it up and and turn it into liquid. And then it would be turned into another plastic roll. Right. You know, and it would just be constantly added to the pure chips that they had come in to create that to begin with. This guy was working on the extruder, which is that big, it's like a, it's hard to explain, man. It's like a pasta maker. If you've ever seen a pasta maker before where it's got yeah. the two long cylinders on it and you put the, the the ball of dough in, but then it turns into a flat sheet of pasta for lasagna. Yeah. That's what this was like. And the guy somehow bypassed a safety switch or a he didn't do his lockout tag out correctly. And he he got his hand caught into the extruder and it basically degloved Ugh. it. God. So for those of you not familiar with the process of degloving, imagine that you just take and cut all the way around your wrist deep enough to where you can pull the skin off of your hand as if it were a glove. Welcome Oof. to degloving. So that's what happened to this guy. And it was a big deal. It was a massive injury, obviously. They were able to fix his hand, but he was going to have some permanent issues from that. They didn't really have a good light duty program, but we had advised them that, you know, they needed to get this person back as soon as they could. And, you know, cause we weren't, we weren't working with them yet, but we were working with them by the time we gave them the light duty advice. And so they decided that they would have this person work at the guard shack where people would come in and out of the business visitors had to sign in and all of that. Cause it, I mean, a decent light duty job. If you have a guard shack, you might as well pop somebody in there. Um, and, and we went and at this point when, you know, when I was talking, when we were talking to them, we were representing them and we were getting ready to go into the workers comp renewal and doing all the things we needed to get done for that. But it was, we were having a meeting with the whole leadership team. So we had, People on our side of the table, they had their VP of ops, their human resources person, CFO, CEO, everybody was in there. And we're, we're talking about claims in the meeting and the VP of ops was an ex steel mill guy. And he basically said, yeah, I'm so tired of getting screwed by all these people. You know, they're getting hurt on the job, doing it on purpose, fraudulent claims. And I'm like, oh, this, this is here we go. go. Yeah, this is going to go over like a turd in the punch bowl, you know? I mean, and he just kept going. And so we got up and somehow we brought up the claim with the degloving. And the CE, the, the, that guy made it, he made a comment. He's like, I am so sick of seeing that guy every time I come to work. It makes me sick to my stomach. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> with this gross but, little hand. And yeah, and the, and the CEO of the company said, you know what? 
I'm glad he's there because I see him every time I come to work and every time I leave. And that's a reminder to me that I have a duty as the CEO of this company to yep. return the people who work for me to their families in the same condition that they came to me every day. Right. And he said, so don't you dare tell me you don't want to see him there because that's the best reminder you can have of what happened on your watch. On your watch. Yeah, exactly. And number one, a bit uncomfortable uh, being in there <laughs> when the CEO is dressing down as VP of ops right in front of you. But it really told me at that point why it's so important to have buy-in from the top down anytime you're going to try and drive change in a company like that. We went in and we, you know, our philosophy is we want to we want to reinforce positive behavior, redirect negative behavior. So if somebody's doing the right thing, we want them to replicate that and we want to catch them doing the right thing. And if they're doing the wrong thing, we want to acknowledge that we see them doing the wrong thing, but maybe do a quick retrain, redirect, get them back on to the right track because psychologically people are wired to respond to whatever gives them attention. Ken Blanchard talks about it in his book, whale done. It's, it's a management and leadership book, but it's, it's based on how they train the killer whales over at SeaWorld. And it's the exact same concept, reward the positive, redirect the negative. And so we ended up coming up with, as we often do a program a safety incentive program for that company. And we took the, the owner of that company's last name was Maxwell. And so we, we actually went out and created fake money. It looked like monopoly money, but we had a caricature done of the CEO and we put it on this fake money and we called it Maxwell money. And he would go in three o'clock in the afternoon, three o'clock in the morning, whenever he would do his walk of the production floor and he would hand out Maxwell money to anybody that he caught doing something right. Supervisors would hand out Maxwell money to people that they caught doing something right. And the employees, the team members would accumulate all the Maxwell money that they got over the course of a month then at the end of the month, they could take it and they could go cash it in at the human resources office and get gift card to a restaurant, gift card to the movies, nice, um, like a company, a, a nice company windbreaker, um, you know, stuff like that. And their mod went from a 1.82 down to a 0.79 um, yep. over the course of three or four years just through that culture shift. And I right. mean, that was a turning point for me. I wouldn't say a turning point, but it was definitely something – it was a landmark event in my career where I saw a CEO who realized they were responsible for what happened in the company. They owned that responsibility and they took it seriously and were going to do whatever they needed to do to fix the issue that caused this accident to happen. And that's, that's, you couldn't ask for anything better than that. Yep. I think the reinforcing of the good behaviors is crucial there. I mean, it, you can't just point out and, um, you, you know, notice everything that that's going wrong. That's not going to, like you said, change the culture and, and drive the right behavior. So that's a, I mean, that's, that's, that's a solid, solid approach there. Something that's a little bit outside of the box um, that, you know, maybe not everybody would think of. For those of you that want to do something like that with your clients, the easiest way to do it is not to create um... fake money. Yeah, fake money. It's to go get a roll of raffle tickets that has the two sides to it. And you just hand out raffle tickets and put the other one in a fishbowl and you draw it out. It's a quick and quick and easy way to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the extra two minutes, but it'll get the job done. The third one is actually the only time in my career that I have been involved in an E&O claim. And it was brought, it was brought against me. Now I'm going to stop and let everybody know that I was dismissed from the case. I had done nothing wrong, but I happened to be named in it, which meant I had to be deposed and everything else, which was an absolute nightmare. <laughs> but I had a client who manufactured personal care products for 
institutional use. So they would do big bottles of shampoo and conditioner, body wash, things like that, that you might use in a hospital or an an assisted living facility, prisons, I mean, all kinds of things. In addition, they had a subsidiary company that manufactured uh, exercise products. And one of the things that they exercise, they did they, they latex related. Oh, dude, I, th- I think I have heard this one. Yeah, latex related. <laughs> so they did like the exercise bands and all of that. But they had done um, exercise balls, the, the crunch balls, the Swiss balls that everybody has. Yeah, and they had had they had problems with quality, and some of the balls had popped, and they had been required to pull them from the market, do a recall, quarantine them, and make sure they never got back out. And as a result, when I engaged with them, they had an exclusion for the exercise balls on their general liability policy, which was in excess and surplus lines. I went to my carrier and made the case that they should write it and do an exclusion for that same product. And the carrier agreed to do that. And they issued the policy and they issued the quote and everything was on there. Everything looked great. They issued the policy directly to the client and somehow it, it didn't somehow inside the agency's quality control. It didn't make it to me. Number one, and this is back at a stage in my – this is early in my career. I was running and gunning. I didn't notice that I hadn't like reviewed the policy or whatever at that time. But essentially what happened is that this particular carrier, when they issue a designated products exclusion, it's a designated products endorsement, and all of the products that are excluded are listed on that endorsement. Got well, it. the policy came – it was it was issued with the designated products exclusion on there, but it was blank. Like there were no products listed. Right. So if one were to read that, you would be of the mindset, hmm, okay, well, it's not designating any products, so there must not be any exclusions. Now, mind you, exclusion was made plain as day in email. It was made plain as day in meeting with the client. It was on the proposal. The client signed the proposal understanding that it was there, but when the policy was issued, it wasn't on there the way that it should have been. So fast forward, I get a call one day, David, we've got a claim on the, on the exercise ball. Okay. And she said, I need you to file the claim. And I said, well, you know that that's excluded from coverage on your policy. And she said, yes, I know, but I need you to file it anyhow so that I can go back to the owner and show him that it's been denied, whatever else. And um, I said, well, you know, I'll, I'll file it regardless. It's not my job to determine whether or not you have coverage. That's what the claims adjuster does. My job's to file the claim if you ask me to. So that's what we're going to do. And I said, so we start getting into this. And I asked her, I said, what's going on? She goes, well, we have two claimants. And I said, two claimants. And they, she said, yeah. I said, for one ball? And she said, yeah, well, you know, the quick and easy way to explain it is there were two people screwing on the exercise ball and they were less than thin. And I think the combined weight on the ball was between 650 and 700 pounds Jeez, between two people. And they want to know why the ball broke. Yeah. Ball blew up. They fell down. Wonder some why inju- some injuries occurred and they were had mental anguish and everything else. Of course, it was such a horrible circumstance at that point. <laughs> so i found dude, i and, have mental anguish from the image that is in my head from your description of this yeah i mean i don't know maybe <laughs> a, I, i'm not even gonna say what i what i want to Ugh. but um we file the claim claim gets denied owner gets upset and decides he's gonna file an e and o because he looked at the policy and he doesn't see that er, there are any products that are excluded even though they know, they know, they know, they know. So it ends up that the carrier decides they want to fight it. And we go into depositions and I would literally was deposed for 12 hours about my role in the whole thing. And sure enough, you know, I end up getting dismissed from it, both me and my agency. What's interesting is that the carrier lost 
even though I had done everything to document and just because way, it wasn't actually listed on there because it wasn't listed on there. And they alleged that because the underwriter who was on that account had 25 to 30 years of experience, that's something they should have caught in the policy never should have been issued that way. Yeah. And so the carrier then appealed and the carrier ended up winning in the appellate courts and no hmm. money ended up having to get paid out. But, you know, guys, listen, the, the moral of the story on this one is don't screw on an exercise. <laughs> call, number, Seriously. One. number two, the, the, the bigger moral is that if you're going to, if you're going to have exclusions and things for on policies, do everything you can to document that on the front end. I mean, I was perfect on that part. I, I wish I could tell you that I was consistently that good at that age in that length of time into my career. I wasn't. I was lucky on this one that I actually had done everything that I was supposed to do. I'm much more habitual about it now than I was then. But, you know, make sure that your clients are signing proposals. If you're having exclusions or they're rejecting coverage, make sure that there's forms drafted around that as well, because it's really important that you have those things on file. Probably wouldn't mm -hmm. hurt send it to the carrier in addition, you know, when you're sending your accord forms that are signed and all of that other stuff, but that's what saved my bacon. If I wouldn't have had all of that stuff, I'd have been toast, man. Well, Hey man, I mean, we, we tell our clients all the time that it's all about documentation. I mean, when you got carriers coming out for loss control visits, we want them to have the proper, do proper documentation of their, um, you know, trainings that they're doing their safety manuals and that sort of thing. So there's no reason why we shouldn't be doing it ourselves. Agreed. Cool. I could well, probably are, keep talking about claims, man, but it usually takes me, it looks like it takes me about 10 minutes to talk about one. So we'll save some for the next time. Yeah. More content. I like it. Yeah, I, I think so. We're taking the lazy way out. We're going to chop this one off about three, four minutes early and tape it on to the next one. So we have a head start. Cool. All right, everybody have a great weekend. See ya. been listening to power producers shop talk you can follow us at the power producers podcast on facebook and instagram and if you want to take your game to the next level check out our commercial insurance training course at killingcommercial.com or visit amazon to pick up a copy of our international best-selling book the extra two minutes